Let's dive into the message today. Um, I got about three hours worth of material that we're going to try to get to in about 40 minutes. Amen. I'm kidding. Um, if you are watching online and you want to follow along or if you're here and you want to follow along, please get that Version app and click the little menu and then click events. And our event is the top one right there. It's important for you to follow along in the notes and see this because um, uh, and save it because a lot of times like you might hear the Holy Spirit say something to you. and You're like, man, what did he say? Like, what, what was what was going on? And I know you can go back and watch it online, but being able to pull it up and read the notes, um, it's really going to be beneficial to you. So be sure you're doing that. Um, this whole series is not a normal series that you might hear in November because it's supposed to be all happy Thanksgiving and pilgrims and Jesus and all that. Right. And, and, and that's not really what it is. In fact, what we're talking about is not something that we typically talk about on Sunday mornings either. We don't typically talk about spirits like this on Sunday mornings or pulling giants down on Sunday mornings. But every week we've had new people come to service on these weeks that we've been doing this series. And it's almost like I'm apologetic that this was their first sermon. It's like if you ever come to church and the first sermon is one on giving, like you're like, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. You know? Like you get apologetic about it. But even today, somebody came first time in first service. And on the way out, I'm like, I know this is not a normal sermon series. And they were like, no, like God showed me something that I'm dealing with in my own life that I didn't know about before I came in. So that's the power of the Holy Spirit. And whenever the Lord says, hey, I want you to do a sermon series on this, we don't take that lightly. We believe that God wants to speak to you personally, not just what we think you should hear, but what we want, what he wants you to hear. And so we've been talking about this, how there are there are giants in Liberty County that are territorial giants that have been here since humans have been here. And we, f- we find this in the Bible, like this is not just some hokum stuff that we're talking about. And anything we ever tell you that seems kind of like on the edge, we always want to give you the biblical backing for it. And if you look at Daniel chapter 10, we see the prince of Persia is the one that kept Michael from coming to Daniel to deliver the message from the Lord, the answer of the prayer. And that the prince of Persia was not an actual man, but a spirit over Persia that was warring against the heavenly uh, angels. And so this is something that's biblical. It's not some craziness, okay? First week, we talked about the poverty spirit and how the poverty spirit has a grip, uh, has had a grip in Liberty County. And, and how to tear that thing down was by generosity. God wants you to be generous. And I don't necessarily just mean financially generous. God wants you to be generous with your time, your talents, your gifts, your abilities. He wants you to be generous in every aspect of your life. Generosity is a privilege. That's one of our core values here. It's not a, I have to give, or I have to spend time, or I have to do this. You get to. You get to be a part of moving the kingdom forward through your generosity. And that's a, that's a privilege, y'all. It's a privilege. We talked last week about addictions and how addiction, addiction basically just boils down to idolatry. That's all it is. It's us trying to put something in place of God. We, we worship this addiction thinking that this addiction is going to actually get us relief from what we're struggling with and that's just not the case this week we're talking about the spirit of discord discord now if we start off in the very beginning of the bible in genesis chapter 1 verse 1 we see some things we see okay first god said let there be light created the heavens and the earth you know we see the earth was without form it was void the spirit of the uh, of god hovered over the face of the deep and all of a sudden there was a delineation between day and night light and dark Um, we see then that the land begins to form by the time we get to verse 10 we've seen several we've seen 10 verses basically of division in the context of the bible god divides the light from darkness he divides waters above and waters below he divides the land from water and then in verses 14 through 18 we see the division of day and night and the seasons established it's amazing you can wake up in the morning and it's and it's you know six o'clock and it's light time already well it's you know, a month ago, it was dark at six o'clock in the morning, right? That, well, God had separated day and night. He separated the seasons. We are in a seasonal shift right now, getting into winter. It's how it works. I'm personally thankful for it. I'm personally thankful for winter. Do you know why? Because, see, you can put more clothes on, okay? You can only take so much off, Jesus. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Now, we don't want to cause nobody to stumble, you know what I mean? But, like, put your coat on. In verse 26, God creates man and gives man dominion over everything. There's another division. God created man and he said, of all the things I've created, I'm separating you apart and giving you dominion over everything, over the fauna, over the the, the, the flora, over everything created. So he takes the man he divided away from the rest of creation and then he commands the man to multiply. You see, God's really good at math, y'all. Really good. Okay. 
That didn't work in first service either. <laughs> then in chapter 2 of Genesis, he makes another division. A woman from man. Aren't you glad there's a difference? Like, fellas, y'all are fun to go hunting with, but I ain't cuddling y'all uh, and watching the Grinch. You know what I'm saying? Like, thank you, Lord. But chapter 3 is where things get spicy. Spicy, spicy. We see it in Genesis chapter 3, starting verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the, uh, of the field that the Lord had created. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of it and ate its fruit, uh, of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was there with her and he ate. Let me just stop right here and say, ladies, it ain't all y'all's fault. OK, you had some lazy man leaning up against a tree. Watch it. Who going to let their wife talk to a snake? All right. I mean, like, really? Like, why are you over there talking to a snake? Snake was talking to me. Well, don't talk back to it and put the fruit down. Like, what you doing with the apple? Like, we always want to get so upset at women. <laughs> well, they ate the apple. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, nah, nah. well, be careful because the dude was just leaning over there watching it happen. Hey, men, take responsibility in your households. That's all I'm saying to you. Come on, ladies. That was your chance right there. <laughs> the man you gave me. <laughs> the eyes of both were opened. And they knew, they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Hey, I don't want to take our attention off of what we're talking about here, but let me just want real quickly say, this is exactly what we do with addiction. The addiction is there to try to cover the nakedness that we feel. God doesn't want to have to make loincloths for you. He wants to fix the nakedness. And if you will let God fix the nakedness, you will find that you don't need the loincloth. You don't need the addiction. Let him fix it. Let him fix the nakedness. We read this passage and it's easy to see the enemy sowing division. And what you may not know is that there are two phrases in this passage. There are actually two words specifically. One of them is crafty in verse 1. And one of them is you will be. In verse 5, you will be, in verse 5, is actually one Hebrew word. There's some interesting meanings behind this. First, look at crafty. Some of your translations will actually say cunning or shrewd. But what the word really means is ill-natured, cross, or divisive. Okay, like you know how a cross is two sticks that are going in the opposite directions? It's the same notion here. It's divisive. And then you will be, in Hebrew, it's hoyal, and it means to fall out. So, If you reread verse 5, for instance, here's actually how you could read it. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will fall out from being like God, knowing good and evil. So, so far there's so much division. We're not even to the fourth chapter of Genesis. God divides and Satan divides. So what's the difference then? Well, when God brings division, it's for a purpose. When Satan brings division, it's to sow discord. So sometimes we actually call godly division evil discord. Let me give you an example of that. Um, Whenever I was at New Covenant, there began to be a season in 2018 where it seemed like the grace had started to lift off of me in my specific roles. And it's not that I was necessarily doing my job bad or, you know, performing improperly or anything like that. It's just it just seems like I wasn't as successful as it was before. You know what I mean? And so um, as we began to, to go through this process, um, we had several people walk up to us and, and tell us like, hey, like one lady actually walked up to us in December 2018 and said, hey, are y'all going anywhere? I'm like, what you talking about? <laughs> like, no, we're not going anywhere. What do you mean? She says, I don't know. I woke up this morning. And the Lord said um, that Jason and Monique were on the way out. And I was like, could you ask him to tell me about that? <laughs> That'd be awesome. You know, um, I'm trying to get a third party revelation. Like, come on, man. And so um, we spent January praying, seeking the Lord. And by the third day of our 21 days of prayer, God had spoken to me that I wasn't going anywhere in 2019, but 2020 was the year. I was like, and so the first thing I did, because I'd killed the orphan and I could embrace 
a, a, a person, a senior leader, as a father figure, a spiritual father, because I could do that because I'd killed the orphan. I went to my pastor immediately and said, hey, this is what I felt like the Lord said. He said, well, let's pray on it. We'll talk about it at the end of 21 days. I'm like, that's great. Well, at the end of 21 days, the pastor that was a senior pastor and his son swapped roles. So now Stephen, Pastor Chuck's son, was now the senior pastor. We went to a conference at Gateway. The conference in Gateway, uh, a guy there named Todd Bolt gave a prophetic word from the platform and said that somebody, you, the grace is lifted off of you in this season and God wants to tell you what to do next, but he will not tell you what to do next until you first go to your senior pastor. It's like, mm. and like Brad, one of the other pastors slapped him. He's like, dude, it's you, it's you. And I'm like, shut up, Stephen's right there. You know, like, don't say anything. So that Tuesday after the conference, uh, I sat there at the, at the table and um, it was just me and Stephen in the room. He was the senior pastor now. And uh, he said, was Todd talking to you? And I said, I think he was. And he slid his journal across the table and it, had, it was written in January. Is the grace lifting off of Jason right now? Now, we started the process of leaving New Covenant and coming to plant Freedom Church. And it was a great process. We had a ton of support from our senior leadership. We had a ton of support from the church. We left from New Covenant gave us $30,000 alone, just New Covenant. That doesn't include the other people in the church that donated as well. We probably walked out with about $50,000 just from New Covenant. That is not a bad leave. You know what I'm saying? Like if somebody leaves you with 50 k like we bless you, love you. And they still, we still text. I was texting them just this week. We have a great relationship. But, but now that people know that I'm not at New Covenant anymore, the first thing people do is go, oh, what happened? Like what, what happened? Like. Come on, man. Y'all know if y'all deal with somebody at the bank and then they're not there anymore, you're like, oh, hoo, hoo, hoo. y'all are like, what happened? You're like, spill the tea. Right, kids? Right. Sorry. Okay. You want to know what happened? Now, why is that? Why? Why do we assume discord? It's because from chapter three of the first book, discord has been active in our lives. That's why. This is crazy. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, now listen, this is how bad English is at translating Greek and Hebrew sometimes. This one phrase in Hebrew conveys the message. It's actually more like this. If you read the words word for word, it's the hissing, most divisive whisperer uttered the fallout to the woman. That's what the Hebrew words really say. The hissing, most divisive whisperer uttered the fallout to the woman. It's insane. It's discord. So what am I saying here? From the beginning, Satan has tried to sow discord into humanity. Now, I ask myself, why? Like, what's he get out of this deal? Like, what's the big deal for him to get discord? Uh, What's the purpose? Well, I think first we need to understand what discord is. It's an intentional lack of agreement, trust, and faith between two people that creates separation, division, and disunity. That's what discord is. It's from a word in Latin, dis, which means negation, and cord, which means heart. It's discord. It is a negation of the heart. There's a Hebrew word that that comes from the din is the root and it means to judge. So what are we talking about? Discord is the result of negating the heart and judging from it. What good for the enemy could sowing discord really bring about? I mean, what's his play? I think it's his Job. Uh, Job, speaking of Job, um, Satan was roaming the earth and he decided he's going to go before the Lord. And as he's before the Lord, God says, hey, what about my boy Job? Which, by the way, God, don't be doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> uh, it's really funny. It's like, I ain't trying to have all that. But, um, but Satan said, yeah, he only loves you because you bless him. Let me at him and see what happens. He says, let me at him and I bet he'll curse you. And so Job tested, Satan tested Job by taking his property, his livestock, his crops, even his family. Then he gave him terrible sores. Now, it's, it's weird. We're, it's a weird disconnect from us right now because we don't really worry about our livestock getting taken necessarily. But what if Satan took everything in your life, your job, your business, your kids, your home? Job's kids were having a get-together. And the roof collapsed and killed all of them. Would you curse God? Would you curse God at that moment? And then to to add to the injury, as Satan was wanting Job to deny God, 
sowing discord in the form of calamity anyway. He even got his wife on board. And in chapter 2, verse 9 of Job, she says, Do you still hold fast to integrity, curse God, and die? I mean, my goodness, killed your kids, took your farm, took your house, took your business, and then got your old lady yelling at you about cursing God and die. Like, my goodness, what else in the world could Satan do? Satan used everything he could to get Job to deny God, even his own spouse. Here's the question. What is Satan using in your life right now to sow discord around you? What's he using? And have you considered that Satan's goal is not to get you to break relationships with people, but he wants to use broken relationships with people to get you to break relationship with God? That's what Satan is after, okay? It's never been about the person that you got a problem with. It's always been about Satan destroying your relationship with God Almighty. Giants aren't trying to take you down. They're trying to take God down. That's what they're doing. Poverty wants you to abandon generosity and to see anything other than God as your source. Addiction wants you to reject God as the focus of your worship. And you know what? Discord wants you to curse God and die. Let me give you a little spiritual life hack. Your current struggle is not designed to destroy you. It's designed to destroy who God is to you. So think about what you're struggling with right now. Listen to me, family. Ain't got nothing to do with you. He's trying to destroy how you see God. And if he can destroy how you see God, he doesn't need to kill you. You know why? Because a bitter former Christian is a great billboard for Satan. Where is there discord in your life right now? The discord that is present in your life and in this area as a whole is focused on getting you to a place where you are separated from God. So I've asked you, how is there discord in your life right now? Then let me ask this. How is Satan using that discord to create enmity between you and God? We have to figure out that the problem you have with that person is not actually a problem with that person. It's a coordinated effort, an attack to get you to curse God and die. And if this is true, then let me ask you this. Why is your justice more important than your relationship with Jesus? Why is you being right against that person so important if it was never about that person to begin with, but simply about you being separated from God? Does that mean that your rightness is more important than Jesus? The spirit behind the issue that created discord could care less about your friendship. It wants to kill your sonship. It wants to kill your daughterhood. That's what it wants. So Satan uses natural relationships to affect spiritual discord. So discord typically attacks in three main areas when it comes to us in the, nat- in the natural. There's word, there's intention, and there's character. So let's start with word. That's what you say. That's what you're saying. What you say matters so much because what you say proceeds out of your heart. You spend any amount of time with anybody and you're going to know what's inside of their heart based on what they talk about. Now, I'm not talking necessarily about, oh, well, they're a crude person and so crude things comes out of their mouth. But let me put it to you like this. Um, if, if somebody, like if their business is their world, you're going to be two minutes talking to them before you hear everything about their business. Right? Or about the chill. Come on, grandparents. Oh, that little grandbaby. That's in your heart. It's going to come out. It's not necessarily always bad things. It's a good thing to but but what's inside of you? Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you really want to know what's in somebody, just let them talk for a little bit. You'll find out exactly what it is. And a lot of discord that happens between people is the result of something that's been said. Okay? A, a, a comedian once did a bit about having a backpack stenographer. All right, a stenographer is the person at court that takes notes of every little thing that's said, and they can read it back. And so the joke was that you got a little backpack and there's like this little person that's a stenographer on the back of you. And everywhere you go, you got a stenographer. Come on, ladies. Y'all know y'all want that. When you're arguing with your husband, he's like, well, I never said that. And she's like, hold on. (laughs) Objection. Can we have the stenographer read that back? Oh, snap. I did say it. In first service, my dad sat right here and goes, boy, that'd be trouble for me. You know, so. (laughs) But it's a funny thing, but isn't it a pretty good idea, right? It's just audio record every little thing. Like, does everybody need body cams? Is that what the answer is? Is that all it is? 
Satan loves to twist words and create moments of discord in your relationships. He loves that. I mean, it's like Ephesians 2 talks about how, the, the, how Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And so as, as your voice, as words you say are nothing but sound waves that travel, Satan takes those. And it's like how many times have you said something and from your mouth to their ear, it's like it got twisted and turned and flipped upside down. And they come to you like, well, you said this. And you're like, I never said that at all. It's like playing a massive game of telephone, but like Satan's in the middle of you. You know what I'm saying? So, so what do we do? How can we, how can we keep Satan from twisting our words? What are there a few things you can do? Number one, speak truth, man. Don't lie. And listen to me, especially you guys. I love you guys, but listen, half truths are full lies. Okay. Oh, I'm not telling a lie. I'm just not really, really telling. The whole truth. You lying. <laughs> like you, I mean, it's like how it's like eating a piece of cake. How can you just how can you eat just a little bit of the cake, but then say you didn't eat the cake? You know what I'm saying? Like you ate the cake. You may not eat the whole cake. But you ate the cake and none of y'all would eat a cake when your little kid is coming up and lick the side of it. Y'all ain't eating that. And I don't know. Some of y'all mamas are weird. Like y'all probably would eat it. The whole point is this. You can't manipulate the truth and then call it not a lie. The second one is speak life. Did you know that your tongue brings life and death? The Bible tells us this. So don't be surprised when discord appears after you've spoken death. So you got that coworker, you can't stand that coworker. But you and the coworker you do like are in the break room and you talking trash on coworker that you don't like. And then you walk in and you're surprised that you and the coworker you don't like don't get along. You just told the other person you hated this coworker. Of course, there's going to be discord between y'all. What about speak correction? And look, I don't mean this. Uh, you need to. Mm-hmm. That's not what I'm talking about. You can't get the neck just a bobbing and weaving and expect good things are going to come out of it. But rather, Matthew chapter 18. Huh? Go to that person and say, hey, listen, I, this is something that I heard or this is something you said. I don't think you meant it to hurt me, but it hurt my feelings. And so, like, can you help me understand what you meant by this? All right. The Bible talks about if you do that and everything goes like it should and everybody is following the spirit on that, you're gaining a brother or sister. But listen to me. You can do that sometimes. And they'll be like, yeah, I did mean it. You're ugly and your mama is too. Like, they might mean to hurt you. But at least you did what you were supposed to do. You know what? If you detect an issue, whether it's your fault or not, go to that person and talk about it. That's biblical. Do you know who the worst people are at this? Church folk. Church folk. It's because we let one little thing rub us wrong. And rather than having a conversation about it, we say, you know what? That's how, that's how they all are. And then Satan got you at the house and you watching some TV preacher for a little bit. And then you decide, I'm tired of doing that. And you stop altogether engaging. Well, guess what? Satan just won with discord. He got what he wanted. It wasn't about you being at odds with the person. He wanted you disconnected from the Lord. What about this last one? Ooh, you only going to like this one. Speak forgiveness. Church, listen to me. Very clear. If you watch it online, listen up. Cut the volume up. Forgiveness is not optional. In Christianity. It's not an option. Okay? Well, but they really hurt me, so I don't have to forgive them. Not an option. Okay? You have to forgive. The Bible says if you don't, then he won't. So, however bad you want forgiveness, is how bad you give forgiveness. The second one is intention. What you mean? Perception is everything. All right? And I hate that. I don't like it at all. I don't like that perception is everything. Because what I mean is the most important thing, right? It's how I intended it. But that's not the truth. What you mean is secondary to what's perceived. And that's not fair. But the reason perception is everything is not because someone's perception of what you intended is always right. It's that the perception always has the power to either sow discord or reject discord. So it don't matter. I mean, my goodness, you can buy your wife flowers. And she'd be like, the perception's wrong. Oh, what did you do? You must have done something wrong. You don't ever give me flowers. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Or, never mind. <laughs> Listen, guys, y'all don't have to like this. 
But we all do this. It's human nature to assume someone's intent if you don't know what their intent was. Has anybody in here ever assumed what somebody meant when they said or did something? Oh, yeah, yeah, yesterday. You know, like, yeah, we all do this. But what does the Bible say about this? What if somebody actually means evil? Well, then look at Romans 12, 17 through 21. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, let me give you a little caveat. You can't be nice to an enemy just because they're going to get coals on their head. That's called vengeance, okay? (laughs) And let me explain why God wants to give vengeance and not you. Because you have to remember that it's not the person that you have the problem with. It's the spirit that you have a problem with. And if you try to get vengeance, what you will do is meet revenge on someone who doesn't deserve it. They were a victim just like you were. But if you allow Lord, the Lord to have his vengeance, he will punish the spirit that started the whole thing to begin with. God's all about restoration with his kids. We need to be about it as well. Um, what, if, what if they don't mean you evil or else you don't know if they mean you evil? Well, Luke 631 says it. This is a great one. You've told your kids this. Do unto others as you'd like them to do unto you. If you want the benefit of the doubt, you have to give the benefit of the doubt. The only real way to make sure your intention gets across is, number one, to start with good intentions. Check your heart. Start with good intentions. And then number two, communicate that good intention. Have you ever heard it said before that if you over-communicate, you're probably communicating just enough? You need to communicate. And the last one here is character, who you are. You know, man, character attacks are really, really difficult. It's really, really difficult. However, when this happened, you can't let discord reign. You You can't let it to be an excuse to just throw off restraint. And go full hook. Like you can't do that. First thing you need to ask is, are they correct? You always need to always point it back at you first. Okay? If your character needs work, hey, listen to me, fam. Work on it. Work on your character. And let me just lovingly tell all of us, and myself included, ain't none of us in here perfect. If you look at online right now, hi, you ain't perfect either. Nobody is. Everybody has character work that they need to do in their hearts and their lives. But the second thing is, and this is really hard, trust God to vindicate you. Trust Him. Now, God might give you an opportunity to correct their understanding. God might not give you an opportunity to correct their understanding. But neither option gives you a pass on trusting God. You need to trust Him. Character, it's a huge issue when it comes to discord because... You can believe that the enemy will use any means necessary to create discord. He can let one person see you having a bad day and all of a sudden they determine that's what your character is. And it's just not the truth. Okay, so rather than trying to defend your character, how about this? Focus on strengthening your character. Trying to defend your character is futile anyway. You ever had a situation where somebody said something about you and it wasn't true, but no matter how hard you try to defend yourself, it's like you just kept shoveling the hole deeper and deeper and deeper. That's all it does. That's all that happens. But listen to me. People can't tarnish what's spotless. So if you'll develop your character and stop trying to defend your character, you're actually going to do better. In the time I have left, here's what I want to do. I want to tell you how we can stop discord in its tracks. It exists everywhere in our lives, but we need to stop it. And remember, I told you before that it's an intentional lack of agreement. So why do I say intentional? Because no one wakes up and trips into discord, okay? You don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, wife, I hate you this morning. I'm going to yell at you all day. That's not how it happens. If it is, like, whoo, we need to talk after. You choose discord, okay? You choose it. You choose to pick up that weapon and start a firing. You choose to let things bother you. You choose to get frustrated in situations and circumstances. And in spite of what happens, you still choose it. And if you are choosing it, I want you to know that the results of that choice are drastic and they are terrible. 
The Bible says in Romans 16, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine you've been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. If you have discord in your life right now and you believe you had a hand in it, let me just ask you to ask yourself, is it the result of your fleshly appetite? If it is, you need to lay it down today and stop sowing discord. By the way, discord is one of the seven things that not only God calls an abomination, he hates it. If it is, you need to lay it down. If it's the other person's fleshly appetite, then you need to do everything you can to be at peace with that person. But listen to me, fam. Even Jesus said at some point, you need to shake your sandals, get the dust off of them and walk away. All right. You can love someone and not have a daily relationship with them. Some of y'all got family. You love them because they're blood, but you don't want to spend a minute with them this week. In fact, you're going to be on the opposite sides of any table or any room you are with that person. Anybody in here? Come on. You got the family like that. All right, you can love them, but you ain't got to let toxicity reign in your life. You don't have to. You don't have to let their insatiable fleshly appetite create discord inside of you. Some people just love drama. Some people in your life, if you allow them to maintain the level of contact that you both have right now, they're going to do damage to you in your walk to God. The Bible says that in Proverbs 16, a dishonest man spreads strife and a whisper separates close friends. In Proverbs 6, 19, a false witness breathes out lives and one who sows discords among bre- discord among brethren. People, some people just like the drama. Listen, this week, it's Thanksgiving week. You have the opportunity to be around some people that love drama. Don't let discord take root inside of you. Because of their inability to control their fleshly appetite. You getting in your fleshly appetite is not an effective strategy to fight their fleshly appetite. I'm fighting fire with fire. Okay, y'all both going to burn. So what do we do about discord? First, it starts with your relationship with God. Unity starts with your relationship with God. It always starts with your relationship with God. John 15, 5 says, hey, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You can't do anything apart from me. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can't do anything. So many of us are having problems because we're trying to live our lives outside of the vine rather than inside of the vine, connected to the vine. So when there is discord between you and God, there's always going to be discord in relationships around you. So if we want to stop discord in its tracks, it starts with you getting right with God. And two things typically happen as a result of this. The first thing is you start living for the right thing, and the result is that things begin to work together for good. Now, this is a great verse. All things work together for good for those that are called according to His purpose, who love God and are called according to His purpose. That's Romans 8, 28. We love that verse. Too many of us misquote that verse, though, and we say all things work together for good for me who's called according to his purpose. But it's for those. Had a great conversation with Shelby several years back. Why this verse? Who's it good for? Because it's like it was pretty good before whatever happened, happened. So how is God working all things together for good for those? How come it's not? I'm not seeing that in my life. Listen to me. As an orphan, okay? And I'm not saying you were an orphan at that time, but don't take it like that. I was like, I just realized this could be bad. No, see, I'm over communicating to stop offense. See, we're doing it. Um, But the whole point is, I know this much when I was an orphan. I was selfish, man. I wanted God to do things for me, not through me. So we have to realize that some of the mess that we've gone through in our lives is not for our benefit. It might be for somebody else who loves God and is called according to his purpose. But an orphan refuses to be a part of that. But a son says, sign me up. And here's why. The son realizes that whatever I'm going through right now, it might benefit somebody else and might not benefit me, but it's worth it. You know why? Because somebody else went through something that I benefited from, that they may not have benefited from. And so what I get to do is as a son, as a daughter, I get to pay it forward to the next person. This is all a part of you having a relationship with Jesus. You start living for the right thing. And listen to me, fam. The right thing is not you and more. That's not the right thing. The right thing is you closer to Jesus. 
you fully engaged in his kingdom in whatever sphere of influence that means for you. You don't have to stop everything you're doing and go be a pastor. You can, you can just spread the love of Jesus in whatever environment you're in right now. And if God has given you a platform and you're successful, he's given it to you so you can be a part that moves the kingdom. It's not so everybody can go, wow, look at you. Okay? That's not how it works. Benefits of godly living, God's presence, his blessing, his pleasure, his spirit, his protection, peace of mind, victory over sin, purpose realized, godly contentment, heaven now and to come, hope, unspeakable joy, strong faith, the ability to reject temptation. And you know what else? Here's the second part of this. Because God is your source and identity and shield and deliverer, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Not even discord. This is the result of you being all in with Jesus Christ. You seek what he wants for your life and not what you want for your life. When I'm living for the Lord and pursuing him with all my might, discord can't get a foothold. If I mess up, I'm quick to ask for forgiveness. Okay, I try to make it right. If I have an opportunity for offense, I reject it and seek peace with that person. If I'm hurt, I offer the same forgiveness I sought when it was my mistake. A strong relationship with God keeps my eye focused on Jesus. And because of that, Satan has little to no opportunity to sow discord in me. Either directly like Job or with others. Through how it, which is how it usually happens to us. I want to remind you. I want to remind you that when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. That God wants you to do for others what he's been willing to do for you. You don't know what that looks like if you're not in relationship with Him. If you aren't right with God, expect discord. But if you are right with God, expect peace. And that's the second one. is God's children pursue peace. God's children pursue peace. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Isn't it interesting how your sonship is connected to peace? Pursuing peace is often hard, and it requires you to understand a couple of things. First, Satan wants disunity so you can expect a battle. Hey, married couples, like, y'all listen up real quick. And I know this works in other arenas, but it's really easy to see with married couples. Satan does not want your family to survive. So he will do everything he can to make you at war with each other. He will, man, you'll be just sitting there watching TV, and all of a sudden, Satan will pop something in your head that your wife did two weeks ago that you remember, oh, yeah, that really bothered me. And then you just start dwelling on it, and all of a sudden, you see her, and you're like, mm, you know? Like, that's what happens. And I know me and my wife, I know, man, my wife, is she's, she's very pretty, and y'all think she's calm and cool and all this stuff. She's a two-chipper, y'all. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Like, she will bust you up, cuz, and I like it. I like, I like a little of the fight back, you know what I'm saying? Like, I need, a, I need somebody that's got a little fight in them. And um, when we were first married, uh, before we got to New Covenant, we about five years. And man, we would, whoo, we'd butt heads, y'all. Ooh, she could fight. I'm talking, she got a really good left hook. I'm, I'm kidding, it wasn't that bad. But we would butt heads pretty bad. And we got to New Covenant, and started, I started working there. And um, Pastor Chuck and I sat down, and we were having a conversation about this. And so we all got together, and here's what Pastor Chuck said. He said, y'all need to come up with a code word that whenever you feel the argument is getting to that level, where you know you're about to say something that's going to be destructive, you yell out that word, and that word means shut up and don't say another word. Go away from each other and pray for 10 minutes. Like, I don't want to pray for 10 minutes. I want to get with it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got my guns ready. I'm ready to go, Jesus. No, no, hush up, go pray. And what it, what it did was it de-escalated all of it. And you know what else I began to realize? It's not that I'm mad at something she said or done. This is the enemy trying to sow discord in my relationship with my wife. You know why? Because we have three kids right now that Satan wants in a broken home. It's the truth. And if you're, if you're walking through that right now, I'm not condemning you by any stretch. Sometimes that happens. But I want you to see that that's a great example of how Satan wants to destroy your life and sow discord in you. So you can always expect a battle. You can expect a battle when you go into work tomorrow and you bow and pray for your lunch. Expect somebody, what are you doing that for? Trying to get the devil off of it? Like, I mean, just, that's how people are. Expect a battle. But the second thing is the battle's always spiritual, man. It's always spiritual. Discord wants to use the natural to negatively impact the spiritual. So remember, you're a spirit with a body, not a body with a spirit. 
Remember that you wrestle against spirits and principalities, not flesh and blood. So evil spirits seek division, but God's spirit pursues peace. So if you are a child of God, you being led by the spirit, you are pursuing peace. First Peter 3.10, for whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. If the natural bent for humanity is discord, then your spiritual bent should be unity. Let me ask you a question. Are you pursuing peace? Are you pursuing peace in your house? Are you pursuing peace at your job, at your business? Are you pursuing peace in your own heart when it comes to the devil throwing what you've done in your face? Are you pursuing peace? If you're not, then why? Last one is this. Refuse to be offended. Refuse to be offended. Completely refuse it. If you want to stop discord in its tracks, don't be offended. Let me tell you something. Offense lives in our flesh. That's where it lives. And offense is a tool of the enemy to sow discord. And there are times when people actually do things to you that are hurtful. Man, you ugly. <sighs> that hurts. Man, y'all know I ain't ugly. Come on, Jesus. No, I'm kidding. Just a joke. It's just a joke. I'm not that arrogant. But people will say things to you that, that are hurtful. They'll say things in a report at work, and rather than just giving an honest evaluation of, their, of, 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 of your job or your work or your, you know, your, your work and all that stuff, they'll throw these little cutting things inside of it just to be mean. There are people that are like that. They're broken and hurting too, just FYI. And remember, you're not wrestling against them. It's not the boss that's putting those little cutting jabs in. The enemy wants you destroyed. There are times when people are hurtful, but just like hurt is not an excuse to engage in addiction, it isn't an excuse to be offended either. But, but wait, that's not fair. I have the right to be offended. They said something offensive. Okay, then let me ask you a question. I'm going to hit you hard with this one. Get ready. How does God deal with you when you're offensive to Him? Do you think that you're never offensive to God? Do, do you think that you never sin? That you've never abused His grace? That you've never wallowed in your flesh before the Lord? How does he deal with our sin? How does he, when we're offensive, what does he do? I'm glad you asked. Be encouraged today. Psalm 103, 10 through 14. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he remembers that we're dust. If God refuses to walk in offense towards us, why do we walk in offense towards others? This all goes back, guys, to what you're seeking. Active offense in your life simply means that discord is winning. That's all it means. It means you're seeking your own desires and refusing to be led by the Spirit. God wants to correct this in us, though. It's always a focus issue. You're either focusing on your flesh, or you're focusing on the Spirit. Which one are you seeking? Which one? Proverbs 17.9 says that whoever covers an offense seeks love. If you refuse to cover an offense, what does that mean you're seeking? Let me give you a hint. It starts with dis and ends with cord. Discord is, is rampant in this area. It's in families. It's in businesses. It's for sure in churches. It's everywhere. But, but God wants us to be set free from the oppression of the Spirit. And here in just a moment, like we've ended every Sunday, we're going to say this confession in just a moment. But it's important right now to just stop and ask the Holy Spirit to show us how discord has been operating in our lives. Okay? It might be in an area that I've talked about, like family, friendships, businesses, churches, in our hearts, whatever. But it might be something else. But it's all designed to sow discord between not you and a person, but you and your Father in heaven. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Will you close your eyes for just a moment? Close your eyes. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, please show me where discord is working in my life. And listen as he, as he speaks to you.
Let me take it a step further. Ask the Holy Spirit, will you show me if there's discord in my life that I've had a hand in creating? And let Him speak to you. All right, one more question, and this is going to be the serious one. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do about it? All right, you can look at me. I didn't tell you where you have discord. I didn't tell you where you had a hand in it. And I didn't tell you what you're supposed to do about it. But he did. So I'm asking you to have the courage this week to do something about it. If it's a family situation, look, this is Thanksgiving. You probably will have an opportunity. I mean, what if you have somebody that you're at enmity with when it comes to your family? And it's not like it's some necessarily like abuse situation or anything like that. I mean, just you're at odds with this person. What if you just walked up to him this week and just hugged him and said, I don't care about the past. I don't care what was said. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I don't want to live like this anymore. You don't have to argue about it. And they don't have to say sorry back. But if the Lord told you to do that with somebody this week, fam, you better have done it by the time you get back to church Sunday. This spirit needs to, needs to fall. It needs to come down. Here's our chance to do that right now. We're going to confess this. It's going to be on the screen. Remember, confession, everything is done in Christianity by confession. You're saved by confession. You're forgiven by confession. Let's confess this. Let's pull this giant down, not only in our hearts, but in Liberty County as well. Amen? Let's pray this. Father, I confess now that a spirit of discord has affected how I think, believe, and act. I acknowledge that I have allowed discord to operate in my life in many ways. I repent before you, Lord, for my involvement with the spirit of discord and come out of agreement with the spirit of discord in the name of Jesus. By the power of your blood and your Holy Spirit in me, Lord, I dismantle it, bind it from attaching itself to me or my dependents, and command it to flee and never return. I confess, Father, that I have allowed offense, bitterness, anger, frustration, jealousy, hatred, among other things, to increase discord in my life. I have chased after my flesh and ignored your spirit in these areas of my life where discord has been working. I confess this as sin and receive your forgiveness. In the name of Jesus, I confess I have allowed discord to impact my relationships with you. Thank you for not walking in offense towards me. And I ask that by your spirit, you restore to us the relationship discord has tried to ruin. From this moment on, I refuse to allow discord to have any impact in my life. I command discord to flee and never return, not just in my life, not just in my family, but in this church and this area in the name of Jesus. I speak unity over my life in this area in Jesus' name. I'm a new creation, and all things are made new in you, Jesus. Fill every space emptied by discord with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Father, we thank you, God. We thank you for this moment right now. We thank you that you've given us the authority and the power by your name and your spirit to pull this giant down. Discord, we curse you in the name of Jesus. You're rebuked by the Lord. You are no longer uh, active in this area in the name of Jesus. We pull you down right now by the blood of Jesus, by his name and by his spirit. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that unity would be unleashed in Liberty County, in this area, in this church, and in our lives like never before. God, I ask that a spirit of unity that comes from you would flood this place in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for it, God. Holy Spirit, help us this week. Help us as we unravel the strands of discord that the enemy has put in our lives. As we have pulled down this giant, God, give us the, 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 uh, the courage this week to do what we need to do to see discord completely and totally eliminated in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. <laughs>